So I'm going to be joined today in this presentation with um, Daniel Clark, who is uh, actually the um, inventor of uh, Apiter and also the developer of Apiters. So Daniel will talk at the end and he will explain to you how to develop uh, Apiters and also a little bit of the background information of how those Apiters are running all in the cloud. But before I, uh, we get there, I would like to um, explain a little bit about the history, about how we actually got to this point of developing those Apiters and getting this idea of having Apiters. So I'm gonna give you a little bit of a history and hopefully it's going to be not too um, off topic, but I would like to share with you the uh, process of how we got to have those Apiters and then what they are and why they are uh, pretty exciting. And I think this is, uh, again, thank you so much for inviting us. I think it was generate some excitement in um, Spark and DKNet uh, to potentially apply those Apiters to the efforts that you have. So uh, when I received my PhD, my thesis project was um, to go to the literature and build this cell signaling network from papers. So at the time, there were not a lot of omics data available. And the idea was that if we go to the literature and find all those uh, binary interactions between uh, cellular components, such as extracellular ligands to binding to receptors, and then finding all of the, the components that directly bind to receptors downstream, and then all of the pathways that are underneath those receptors, if we connect them into a network, we're really going to be able to start understanding how cells work. And we came up with this uh, blob network and we didn't go very far about how much we understand how cells function, but this was uh, an effort, a manual effort that required reading over a thousand papers and trying to get like um, understanding, a naive understanding of how cells uh, work with the data that we used to have. But nevertheless, this paper was published in Science and it helped me to get a job at Mount Sinai as a professor. And the first project that we've done um, after, you know, when I started my lab was instead of us going to the literature and reading all those papers and extracting those interactions from literature, we started um, you know, taking databases that other people published and combine them uh, and processing the data within them in a way that we could uh, potentially reuse them. So this was the work of Alex Lackman, who was a software engineer in the lab at that time. So uh, we found six databases that had information about kinase substrate interactions. And we um, wrote scripts to process that data into a database and then uh, create this tool called kinase enrichment analysis. So you come in with your substrates, like your list of proteins, and then the program prioritize kinases that are most likely um, regulating those lists of proteins. And just a week ago, we published a um, paper that is the third version of this idea of kinase enrichment analysis. And this is the work of Maxime Kuleshov, who is a software developer in the lab. And uh, now this uh, database of kinase substrate interactions grew from six uh, process database to about 18. So you have this a way to also integrate the kinase enrichment across all of those databases together. Very similarly, we also uh, collected and processed data from cheap seq experiments for the sake of enrichment analysis. So we simplified the data from those cheap seq experiments into transcription factor target uh, associations. And this is a paper, also one of the first papers that we published as a lab in 2010, and it's called CHIA. So CHIA is a cheap enrichment analysis, and it was sort of like following the KIA idea. And at the time, we just manually went to uh, publications that reported cheap seek studies for transcription factors, and we extracted the targets from those papers and made this database that people can come with their differentially expressed genes 
and get prioritized transcription factors and potentially regulate those genes. And two years ago, we published this third version of this Chia 3, and this is the work of Ali Keenan, an MD, PhD uh, student that graduated uh, already, and she created this idea of combining the databases into a composite uh, score that prioritize the information from all of those databases together to get the most likely transcription factors and kinases from a list of input genes. So this is just two examples of this concept of you can take data from many uh, NIH funded and other database and resources where you can uh, write scripts to simplify this data and combine it into networks. And it, more specifically, what we've done is creating those gene set libraries. So you have a term and then you have all of the genes that are associated with that term. And you can represent it also as bipartite graphs and also attribute tables. So all of those data structures that simplify the, the data in a way that then it can be used for um, data integration, search like the way we did for Chia and Kia, as well as for machine learning, which I'm not gonna cover today, but the idea is that you need to abstract the data from all of the resources in a way that then it can be integrated. And this is outlined in this uh, review article that we wrote in 2014. At a very high level, you have uh, associations, binary, bipartite associations between genes, protein, variants, uh, to gene sets, modules, and pathways, drugs, small molecules, cells, and tissues, and diseases, and phenotypes. So all of those things can be connected through those relationships if they are really abstracted to those high-level terms, and then you can build those uh, databases and tools. More recently, we also added to this diagram subjects and patients and assays and experiments. So all of those things can be connected in the same way. And we're really focusing on gene sets and modules and pathways in our curation process. And for this, uh, we developed this relatively well-known tool called Enricher. And Enricher has uh, currently uh, over 300,000 annotated gene sets, organized in 172 gene set libraries. And there are over uh, 37 million uh, gene sets were submitted for enricher for analysis. This uh, screenshot is from an interface of an updated version of enricher that we are very close to releasing soon. So everything else looks the same except this er area where you can now going to be able to enter a gene, a single gene a term, like a search term or a variant. And then using different ways to expand, we can convert that term or that gene or that variant into a gene set. And then you'll be able to start enrichment analysis with other things besides uh, entrance gene, gene set. So this is going to be released soon. So you're not gonna find that particular version of Enricher on the site. In general, if you uh, submit a gene set for enrichment with Enricher, you get this dashboard of um, bar charts for the top matching terms for each library from each category. And if you press the, the 37 million number at the top, you'll get this plot that shows you how many gene sets are submitted each day. And yesterday evening, there were already 82,000 uh, lists submitted to Enricher yesterday. So this is in a single day. And those lists are submitted by almost a thousand users per day. So it's been a real success for enabling the community to analyze gene sets and search for gene sets. And the way to actually promote the tool, one of the things that we've done was to create this Chrome extension called Geo to Enricher. And Geo to Enricher, um, you just come to the Chrome store, you install it, nothing really happens, and still you go to a Geo page. 
And once you are in a geo page, this is, for example, um, study that looked at glucocorticoids effects on uh, monocytes and macrophages. And then uh, all of a sudden you see this additional information added to this geo landing page. For example, here you can have those check boxes where you can mark the control and perturbation experiments. And here, for example, I marked uh, three controls uh, in macrophages and three dexamethasome treatments uh, uh, samples. And then once you have these uh, samples marked, you get uh, this uh, 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 pop-up that gives you the information about the study. You can add some metadata about it and then you can press on this extract gene list and then that gets piped to Enricher. So we um, uh, delivered a course on Coursera in the early days of Coursera and asked the students, and there were at the time about 10,000 students, we asked them to uh, install this Chrome extension and uh, help, help us to extract signatures from the crowd. So about 70 uh, contributors um, signed up and they uh, extracted uh, gene expression signatures together with us for a collection of about 6,000 uh, gene perturbation, drug perturbations, and disease perturbations signatures. And they use this geo to enrich a Chrome extension uh, to do that. And then uh, the only issues with that was that this data was for microarrays and microarrays have been replaced by RNA-seq data. So several years later, we developed the capability to handle RNA-seq and that required first to process the data um, because the data for microarrays are very organized on GEO, but RNA-seq is uh, pretty messy. You can only get it at the row counts or as the uh, Excel spreadsheets that are not uniform uniformly processed. So uh, first we had to process all of those raw counts, uh, raw files, raw reads files into counts. And then uh, we were able to uh, provide this BioJupy's generator um, Chrome extension that assists you to extract uh, signatures from GEO for RNA-seq datasets. So this is starting to get closer to um, uh, the talk today, which is Apiters. So with the BioJupy's um, Chrome extension, you once you go to Geo, for the study that are supported by BioJupy's, you get this button that is added onto the just beneath an entry on Geo. That means that BioJupy's can process this data, already process this data. And I'm going to just show you a demo of how that BioJupy's uh, is working for on GEO. And what I've done is I, I just typed in, in BioJupy's on the BioJupy's landing page, diabetes. And then I um, scroll down to find a study that I would like to analyze. So for example, here, the study is RNA-seq that compares wild type and DBDB um, mice, uh, isolate for mice. So there are nine samples. And then I can click Analyze. And the first uh, interface is uh, giving me a set of tools that I can pick from. So there is PCA, cluster grammar, library size analysis, for example, differential expression, volcano plots, links to enricher, gene ontology analysis, and also finding small molecules that can either reverse or mimic the expression based on the links data. So ne next thing is to you press continue and then you can select your samples. So here I want to compare the wild type as the controls to the DBDB uh, mice. And then the next step is to actually generate the notebook. So what it does during the notebook generation, it goes to our database of process data sets from this um, study. So those are the counts and then it computes the signatures and executing a Jupyter notebook. So it has a template of uh, Jupyter notebook to execute. 
And then once that uh, template is executed with the different parts, everything is filled and it's done for you. So typically when you have a Jupyter notebook, you, are, uh, you have to write it yourself, you have to write the code, but in this particular case, you set up all the properties and then using two libraries, uh, two Jupyter uh, libraries, uh, we can format the notebook on render it first and then execute it in, in the cloud. And then you get a permanent link of the report. So I'm going to let it run. It usually takes less than one minute to complete. And I'm going to go back to the presentation. And I'm just going to tell you that um, a, a little bit about a DBDB mice. So those are genetically mutated mice that have um, defective leptin receptors and they are extremely obese and they have the similar metabolic defects that you see in diabetes as well as in the most famous OBOB mice. So let's see if it's finished. No, it's still running. Okay, so let's continue the presentation. So one of the things that uh, happened with uh, BioJupies is that it, it was very well received. It also have a lot of users and a lot of people are coming there to also process their FASTQ files. So one of the functionalities of BioJupies, it can come there with your raw uh, FASTQ files and then you can um, uh, get full analysis from your raw data all the way to something that looks like a paper. And Leo Pachter, who is a famous computational biologist blogger and also a famous the researcher. He developed the Callisto aligner and many other uh, widely used uh, resources. He wrote in one of those blogs when BioJupies came out, how you can potentially write a paper in four minutes. So this is, um, uh, it was a real like testament of like the our ability to create this uh, transforming type of resource. So beyond BioDrupies and Chia and, and Richer, if you count all of the tools that we published in the last 12 years, it's the number is growing to over 42. We can count across all of those tools, 1.2 million unique users. We now see about uh, 3,000 users a day and 30,000 users per month, and we get a lot of citations for those tools. And for the links, uh, BD2K Data Coordination Center, one, one of the things that we tried to do was to create this um, app store for all of the tools and by, uh, that we developed, but also were developed by other laboratories that are a part of the links consortium. So all of those tools are listed in this um, a tool app store um, but ha that has not been very successful so there are some people that come there and find tools that way uh, but in general uh, maintaining bioinformatics tools and because of the fact that they were developed by graduate students and temporary people and also the rapid pace of how technology is changing is not that easy and the idea is that um, those this approach to developing and publishing tools could be really uh, changed with Apiters. So the Apiter paper uh, was published in um, this, e uh, this year, like earlier this year, and it was really the uh, ingenious type of um, invention by Daniel, who will, you'll hear from uh, very shortly. And the idea is to turn Jupyter Notebook into a bioinformatics app. So you construct your regular Jupyter Notebook as a bioinformatician, but you add to it some, uh, what we call like magic code that uh, specify which uh, global variables will be um, turned into a web form where the user or the experimentalist can come with their data and then they can upload their data and also set up all kind of like uh, parameters 
and then uh, we execute the input similarly to how BioGPs does it. So um, I think the next thing is to talk to you about a recent aperture that we developed together with the ATI lab and Mark Keller. So Mark Keller and Kathleen Jagotnik who is a postdoc in my lab and Mark is a senior scientist in the ATI lab. They uh, manually went to GEO and identify high quality uh, diabetes gene expression studies. And from those, they created this uh, master um, Excel spreadsheet that has many more rows than what you see here. So it's, a, I think it, there are over like 500 or 600 rows in this file. And most importantly, they identify the control and perturbation samples from each of those studies. And then Alex Lackman uh, processed these data sets to signatures and then Sherry G uh, created an aperture for that data. So I'm gonna go out of the presentation again. Let's see if first BioGP is finished. Fortunately, it did not. So there must be some problem with the site because it should not take that long. So I apologize for the attempt of the live demo. It works all the time. So this is uh, Murphy's Law of um, not being working, but now I'm gonna to try to demo the um, Daddy's um, aperture as an example aperture that we created and show you how the, those aperitures work. So the, all of those aperitures are served on this aperture catalog and within the catalog I typed diabetes. And right now there is only one diabetes related aperture. So it found that aperture that is based on the work of Mark and Kathleen. So once you uh, find it, you can press select. And then here you have a splash page that demonstrate the aperture. And then if you click start aperture, it evokes this uh, web form. And this web form in this particular case for this aperture is very simple. There is just a place to put in a gene. So I can put in some um, famous um, diabetes genes, which is uh, TCF7L2. And then when I press submit, the aperture is executed and it's executing this Jupyter notebook. And you can actually see the code. If you do toggle code, by default, you're not gonna see the code. And then if you scroll down, you can see interactive uh, figures that a query that database that was created by Mark and Kathleen. And then you can find studies that either upregulate or downregulate the a gene of interest, which is TCF7L2. And those studies in that they have like um, both full change and p-value um, that is statistically significant. And those are the large uh, circles on the plot. And this is an idea that Mark Keller uh, was thinking of uh, transforming the volcano plots into um, a way to find matching studies for a gene. So typically volcano plots are used for a differential expression analysis, but here we are looking at the most um, matching studies that can potentially turn off or on a gene. And if you scroll down, you have a table with the results and the p-value and full change, a link to the study. And also you, you have that for both uh, mice and humans. So in mouse, we actually get more hits. So we can have uh, clues about uh, which perturbations, for example, could potentially turn off or turn on this uh, target gene. So I'm going to go back to the presentation. So this is this diabetes aperture. And currently we have 80 uh, aperitures in this catalog. And the point is really that it makes it very easy to develop those uh, bioinformatics resources. And it's also much easier to maintain them. And a, a little bit about some other um, aperitures that are should receive a notable mention. 
So we also have a complete remake of the BioJupy's pipeline with the spoke RNA seq analysis pipe and pipeline Apiter. We also have support for single cell RNA seq analysis, a site seq. We also have this uh, gene ID mapping Apiter where we put in gene symbol and then you can get the matching entrance gene symbol, which is important for a lot of our analyses. Uh, the Kia 3 um, website was also implemented as Apiter, which is an example of how you can take an existing bioinformatics tool and convert it into an Apiter. We also have a way to look at RNA-seq data that was collected from patient cohorts and combine it with clinical parameters to identify clusters. And then uh, there is an easy way to get the TCGA data, the new TCGA data, with this TCGA data loader, uh, comparing sets with all kind of uh, different visualizations, as well as these machine learning pipelines that are implemented for uh, predicting or imputing information about genes and drugs with drug monizome ML and harmonizome ML. And I saw some IDG uh, members that are on the call that are working with us on developing those resources to impute knowledge about understudied uh, genes. So I think this is now time for me to hand over the presentation to Daniel. And um, I don't know, Daniel, do you want to become a presenter or should uh, you can control it for me? I, I can try. Yeah. I think my video is getting a little weird. But, um, okay. So you can hear me okay, right? Yes. Okay. So I'll get right into this. So basically, what's an Apiter and how can you create one? Uh, essentially, what we're doing with Apiters is uh, you saw BioJupies, how BioJupies allows you to take uh, data and customize the things you want to run. Uh, and then ultimately, you get a notebook as a report. And the whole idea behind Apiters is really to turn this into um, a way that you can just write a Jupyter notebook. Uh, and with that Jupyter notebook, you gain an entire uh, web application that works in much the same way. Um, and so kind of to demonstrate the versatility of Apiters, uh, I'll show you how to actually create your own. Um, Apiters is a Python library and can be installed with a pip install Apiter. Uh, it's also a Jupyter notebook, so you'll need both Apiter and Jupyter. Um, and uh, being familiar with how to write a Jupyter Notebook uh, is pretty necessary for writing an Apiter, but uh, writing a Jupyter Notebook is also pretty easy to get started with. Um, once you have your Apiter and Jupyter installed, you can uh, launch the Jupyter Notebooks interface uh, by running the Jupyter Notebook command. This opens in your web browser. Um, and uh, you'll get an interface that looks like this. And uh, you just create a new notebook. Um, and then you get uh, an interface that looks like this. Uh, to start using the Apiter, you need to put in this special cell um, to initialize the Apiter magic. Uh, this is a snippet that you'll just put at the top of any Apiter. And uh, that snippet is available uh, on the GitHub. Um, and, you know, on the readme of Apiter, so you can find it. But uh, you just paste this into the notebook, and you're ready to get started. Um, once you have this set up, now you basically have a normal Jupyter notebook, but uh, with the Apiter features, which we'll discuss shortly. Um, to actually view the Apiter, uh, Apiter basically is another command line that just like the Jupyter command uh, will serve uh, a notebook. So you can run the Apiter command line uh, just 
by typing Apiter, um, and then put the name of the Jupyter notebook that you have. Uh, and in this case, uh, there's some extras that you can include. And I include this uh, profile equals BioJupies, uh, which we made. It's kind of like an add-on, and it makes it pretty, um, kind of like uh, the BioJupies theme. Um, but there's a few other profiles that are also available. Uh, but I think we use this one a lot. And uh, this will, similar to the Jupyter Notebook, will launch a uh, web URL. Uh, and when you visit that, you get the Apiter. Of course, uh, since we have a completely blank notebook, uh, we have a completely blank Apiter, but this will change shortly. Uh, so to make an Apiter, we need to make a Jupyter Notebook. Uh, and so we need to make something useful. Um, as part of this demonstration, I figured, okay, let's, uh, COVID is popular. <laughs> let's take a look at the COVID tracking project data. Um, so this uh, data was being collected by uh, the CDC and uh, it's available for the public to download. All it contains is uh, the US data uh, of COVID deaths, hospitalizations and uh, things like this. Uh, and uh, the Python pandas package is very good at uh, dealing with uh, spreadsheets like this. And so we can import that package and then uh, load this data straight off their website uh, and view it in our notebook. So we know what we're looking at. Uh, once we've done that, we can uh, try and do something with this data. So first we'll, uh, you know, some pandas, uh, stuff, we'll uh, take the date and make sure uh, Pandas knows that it's a date. Uh, and when we do that, we can then plot uh, deaths over time uh, with this data. Uh, we see there's like a lot of different trend lines, and that's because this data has um, all the different states in it uh, for each date. And uh, so if we instead filter the data frame, uh, and just take uh, New York, for instance, so that's where we're based in. Um, we can then plot that, and now we have a kind of a smooth um, function. So this is you know, pretty uh, straightforward, like simple thing to do. Um, but uh, let's just say, uh, for the sake of demonstrating how we can make an appiter, we want the user to actually be able to choose their own state here. Uh, so instead of you know NY, we want the user to put whatever they want. Uh, and that's where Apiters kind of comes in, right? The power of Apiters is in allowing you to parameterize your code. Uh, and the way we uh, opt in to the Apiter functionality is through uh, this Jupyter magic. Uh, so this is from the Jupyter uh, project, they have these things called magic. And when you register magic, it creates a function that you can call uh, with this percent percent um, invoke like uh, syntax. And uh, basically, uh, percent percent apiter activates the apiter function and then exec code tells it we want to treat the whole cell as um, apiter code. And once we do this, what we do is we gain uh, Jinja2 uh, template uh, mechanisms. If you're not familiar with Jinja2, um, it's a very popular uh, Python templating library. And effectively, these curly braces uh, allow you to enter the Jinja2 context. And what it is is a substitution. So if you have a variable in the Jinja2 world, um, like for instance, state, um, by putting these double curly brackets, we're substituting this variable uh, in the final uh, string. The other thing that uh, Apiters provides you with is a whole set of different uh, so-called fields. And these fields essentially allow you to specify how that variable should be uh, created. So in this case, we create an autocomplete field. 
uh, autocomplete field allows you to have a, a set of possible strings, in this case, all the different states. Uh, and then we basically can add a label, a description, and a default. And uh, the way this ends up getting used in the appiter is that you end up with a form that uh, facilitates auto-completion. So right, we just wrote this over here in our appiter, but once we save it, uh, the appiter updates uh, with our form. And uh, of course, you can change these and, and they'll update. And uh, then what happens is that uh, by using the default, we'll actually uh, compile this and figure out what it ends up being, right? So this state ends up substituted down here, um, and then we actually execute it. And so in this way, we can actually play around with uh, these templates uh, and still kind of have the experience of a typical Jupyter notebook uh, where we can play around with um, what we're actually doing. But uh, once you have this, you gain a fully operable uh, Appiter application uh, in that uh, a user could come here and put in any state, and we could re-render this notebook uh, with the stuff they put. Uh, another really uh, important part of Appiters is not just allowing you to tweak uh, parameters like the string, but in fact, also allowing you to uh, accept file uploads. Uh, and so a file field lets you take a file upload. And uh, one thing we like is to have these examples. Um, so examples will point to a actual file on the web somewhere that can be downloaded. And uh, the usefulness of this is that um, like users can know what the file needs to look like uh, because you can read a CSV and it can have all types of different columns, but your Appiter may depend on a specific uh, format. It's definitely important to make sure people know how they need to format uh, their Appiter and that information should be included uh, in the description of the file field. Uh, next step uh, beyond uh, what we did before, we may want to kind of uh, so do some prettification, you know, make our appiter a little nicer uh, than basically what you see here with this customize your notebook uh, stuff. And to do this, uh, we have this concept of a section field. Uh, these sections refer to each individual block uh, that is like expandable and collapsible. Uh, it can have its own icon. Um, and you can even group these fields uh, like for the point of code organization um, in their own cell. Uh, in this case, we use this hide code argument, uh, which tells us that this is like a pure uh, Appiter cell and it's not really gonna be seen in the output. Uh, but once we've added our icons and stuff, we get a kind of a somewhat complete Appiter. You can see how these examples end up looking. Uh, you can click uh, load example and then it will upload the uh, actual example URL uh, into the Appiter um, or they can just download it to look at it uh, themselves to understand how it's supposed to work. Uh, finally, like you can turn your notebook into more of a publication it's one thing to just have some basic Jupyter notebook, but uh, to really bring the most value out of these appiters is to actually annotate very well each individual section of your appiter. Um, so I, you know, really quickly put some stuff here, but uh, one thing to note here is that uh, here's yet another way you can use the appiter instead of uh, for code. Here, we're actually using it to render markdown. Um, and then we can use that state variable that we captured from the user and actually template the um, actual written language that we have as well. Uh, it's, of course, essential that uh, the Appiter has you know, figure, leg figure legends and citation information. 
so that when someone executes the aperture, they kind of get a paper um, on the other side. Uh, once you have this uh, set up, you can start testing your aperture. Um, and this is really what the aperture will look like. Um, you have your first section with the fields that we've specified. Uh, you can load the example and submit it. Um, and then you'll see in the next page, you get this uh, executing uh, notice. And when it finishes executing, it'll say success, hopefully. Uh, but it, it executes this in real time while you're looking at it. Uh, and this is how it works uh, in production as well. So basically, uh, unlike what we had with BioGPs, where you look at a, a spinning circle, here now you can actually see the results as they're coming in. Uh, finally, once it's actually ready, uh, you have your static um, aperture, and you actually get a persistent URL that you can share with other people. Uh, and that uh, Aperture instance will be accessible to anyone who has the URL. Um, and uh, another neat thing is that uh, it will be kind of saved. So if ever someone were to run the same analysis with the same parameters, they would actually end up at the same uh, static notebook and it wouldn't have to re-execute. Uh, to run in production, um, you know, basically not much has to change from what we started with uh, when we ran our aperture uh, with the aperture value. Uh, once we specify debug equals false, um, we'll actually get a highly optimized production instance um, of the aperture runtime. So you can actually use this to host it yourself outside of the catalog, but we definitely encourage uh, people publish on the Aperture catalog more information about doing that and on documenting uh, these various features I showed, including the different fields and such, uh, can all be found on the Aperture site. Um, so now kind of talk a little bit about uh, the architecture of the Apertures. Uh, basically, uh, what we do is have a single source of truth, and that single source of truth is the Jupyter Notebook itself. Um, by having everything in the Jupyter Notebook, uh, we can take our command line application and uh, do all types of different uh, things with your notebook. Uh, we can construct the uh, serialization of your aperture given um, actual values for all the variables that you specified. We can execute it um, in real time. Uh, we can serve a REST API so that other people can actually execute your Aperture um, remotely over HTTP. Uh, and we can also serve this uh, Aperture web form that you saw, uh, or in fact, the web view. Uh, furthermore, we also have in the command line application, uh, ways of doing multi aperture orchestration, uh, such as execution, queuing. Um, so making sure that if a lot of people are trying to execute an aperture at the same time, uh, they'll say in a, in a line. Um, and of course, these other types of uh, helpers. Uh, one other thing that I'll note for the catalog uh, we have this aperture.json, which is a version controlled and programmatically validated uh, file with some metadata about the aperture uh, that we provide in addition to the notebook. Uh, and this has the author like uh, license information and uh, version and, and tags. And this stuff actually gets put into the notebook on the catalog. Uh, we're actually considering uh, embedding it in the notebook uh, from the onset through uh, the Aperture. Uh, but, um, so this whole like uh, framework in the catalog um, is being held, handled with continuous integration. And essentially, 
uh, when people come in with a pull request, uh, we run a GitHub action on each appeter that comes in. And this action will build the appeter. Um, and it will also validate uh, that this metadata file is good. Um, then it will actually use the most current appeter version to build uh, the appeter with the defaults and execute it and make sure that it doesn't break anywhere along the way. Uh, and this really helps us uh, make sure that all your Python dependencies are, are in order, your uh, Docker file is working properly, and uh, you're not going to see an error, at least with the defaults in production. Uh, we also do a manual review, um, even after uh, we've done the testing. Uh, and finally, once we merge this uh, into the main branch, uh, the production instance uh, will actually pull from GitHub as well. And uh, this production instance is completely cloud agnostic and uh, portable. Uh, essentially, we leverage several uh, existing tools, including um, traffic for our load balancer. Uh, that is, uh, users will hit traffic and traffic based on the packet will route it to one of our containers. Uh, the catalog uh, is dockerized. The, all the appeters are, of course, dockerized through this process. Uh, we also have a um, shared S3 compatible uh, storage for the data in the appeters um, and the resulting notebooks. Uh, and then internally, we use uh, the appeter command lines orchestrator um, and execute to actually queue jobs um, and execute the appeters as they come in. So if we get uh, too many people trying to execute appeters at the same time, uh, they get queued uh, and eventually they get executed. Um, all of this is represented with uh, these Docker Compose and uh, Kubernetes compatible uh, syntax. So this can be deployed um, on Kubernetes or indeed just uh, like on a single system. Um, and uh, that's that's it. I'll uh, pass it back to Avi. Sure. Thank you, Daniel. Uh, I think we're doing pretty good with time. Uh, let me uh, share the screen on this summary. Okay. So I just wanted to reiterate the beginning of the talk. We talked about how we systematically go to the publicly available omics resources and convert them into abstract uh, gene sets and drug sets. And that really helped us to build very useful bioinformatics tool for the community. And really now appeters are making the development of those bioinformatics tools uh, you know, very rapidly and easily. So this will enable us to uh, maintain and run those uh, tools anywhere and uh, like was said. And we did have some case studies of how we can also enable those uh, appeters in the collaboration with the ATI lab, uh, how we could create hypothesis generation appeters for the diabetes community. And this is uh, potentially something that DKNet could uh, work together with us and incorporate some of those capabilities uh, in a joint effort. So I just would like to thank all the members of my lab uh, for their contributions. I think all of them in some way contributed to either developing appeters or um, you know, assisted with preparing the data for those appeters. I also would like to uh, give a special thank to Drs. Atti and Keller from the University of Wisconsin-Madison that 
in the past few months worked with us to uh, develop this diabetes uh, hypertherapy that they would. So I think we have some time for Q and A. Um, yes, I already see some questions in the chat. So um, I think first question is from Dr. Mahir. Um, what would be the main reasons to publish the Epitors on the Epitors web portal instead of hosting it on other services? So I think uh, it potentially will help you to for other people to find it. So it will be um, also you don't want to repeat type of analysis, but we had we had some uh, initial contributions of the community uh, publishing their appeters on our site. And then also there is uh, people that just use the framework to uh, create their appeters for their site. So they're, um, you know, but there is no real uh, motivation besides having it in all in one place and make it more findable. We do have, um, you know, having it on the catalog does give you this additional layer where you can have the authorship and the versioning and the tagging. So this gives you this ability to um, uh, get some feedback from us as well as uh, present it in this splash page. And potentially in the future, we're going to add the DOIs to those aperitures. We already registered with Crossref, and the idea is that we will um, make those pub as the bona fide publications that are citable. So, um, yeah, I hope I answered uh, some of those. Uh, this particular uh, question. Okay, and the next question is from Rong. Uh, the Epitor pipeline depends on openly available data. Does credit occur back to the original data producer? So it's really depend on the generator of the Epitor. So if the generator of the Epitors, they have an option to, you know, give back links to the source of the data. Um, so it is uh, part of the process. What we have also, we have about 30 appeters that are processing data from all of those resources that I mentioned. So in those appeters, we do provide credit and links to, this, to the parent resource. But uh, this is something that can be added uh, into individual appeters, but definitely it's, it's a practice that should be followed as a general rule, but there is no enforcement of this. If, you know, we are doing it, but if you are developing an app, I don't think it's a, like a requirement that you can control. Okay, thank you. Uh, next question is from Marian. Uh, what is the minimal skill set someone would need to use Epitors effect effectively? So I think it's really minimal skills. So that's the whole idea. This is targeted to experimentalists that have no computational skills. They have um, a table, a data table, or they have they want to compare some sets. They want to visualize some data, or they want to find information about a gene. And those aperitors uh, basically do not require them to get their hands dirty or in code. They can just come to the form, fill up the form, sub press submit, and then get the results. So zero skills, the zero coding or computational skills. Uh, the real, the presentation that Daniel gave is more for uh, showing how easy it is for someone with relatively uh, beginner skills in uh, developing bioinformatics tools and workflows it really uh, lowered the barrier of entry of delivering a bioinformatics app. So it is definitely you need to know how, if you are a data scientist, uh, like a beginning data scientist, you can um, you may not know how to build a web app, how to construct a reliable database that is connected to a web server and make it like user-friendly. So this is also make most uh, data scientists don't really have those skills. So this makes it for them uh, sort of like a shortcut to build an app that other people can use. So 
this is really enabling the collaborators and their, um, in general, the community to use a workflow that they develop for specific analysis uh, without them needing to know how to build a complete web app themselves. Okay, uh, there's a question. Um, Fang Senya, I might have missed this, but when running editors on the cloud, are there any computational limitations for machine learning example, for instance? Yeah, I think Daniel, maybe you can answer that better. Obviously there are some limitations, yeah. uh, but uh, Daniel can uh, give a better answer on that. Yeah, um, so no such thing as a free lunch, of course. So um, if you are running uh, your Appiter, um, if it does something very expensive, it will be very expensive. So the Appiters that we have there uh, all use shared resources. Um, so the Appiter catalog itself uh, has about 16 gigs of, of RAM max. And, and this is like a communal uh, pool. So if, uh, you know, if other people are running Appiters, um, then you are kind of sharing that resource usage. Uh, so there is some limitations for that, but uh, in terms of like what Appiters are bringing to the table compared to uh, similar things like MyBinder uh, or Google Colab, uh, I think the Appiter runtime is competitive with those uh, in terms of like how much resources you have access to. Uh, most of our Appiters don't use that much memory. Um, some of them, if you click all the options, they will use all the memory. And so the Appiter will run out of memory. But uh, all the Appiters have been set up since they're Dockerized. Uh, on any given Appiter, you can click some instructions to actually run it on your own resources. Uh, and you know, if you have a system with a decent amount of memory, uh, you'll be able to run it uh, to completion on your own system. Um, so yes, it, there are limits, but uh, you know, uh, yeah, it, it's still a, it's a free resource right now. Uh, we're considering like allowing you to set it like uh, log in with your cloud account and then use your cloud resources. But for now, the solution, if what you're trying to do is uh, beyond the capacity of our publicly allocated resources is to run it on your own uh, machines. Okay, and um, one more question. Uh, are GPU being used on the cloud? Not yet, but we are playing with GPUs in the lab. We have five machines that have uh, GP GPUs, so, and we have um, sort of like set those up, uh, but it is um, a good idea for some of the, um, you know, those uh, high demanding uh, editors that do the machine learning to potentially uh, use that. Daniel, I don't know if you want to add about that. Yeah, I mean, we don't, uh, we don't currently uh, have any GPU support uh, for the Appiters, but if we had an Appiter that needed GPU support, uh, we could definitely set that up. 